All right, welcome everyone to History 1302 at Como Picton. My name is Austin Baxley, and this will be our World War II lecture, the follow-up to the Great Depression and New Deal lecture. Trying to get these first few lecture videos out really fast so that y'all can use them for the test that I handed out uh, via email earlier this week. Um, the rest of them will probably come out a little bit more periodically, but I just wanted these first three to come out real fast, bam, 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 so that y'all could get the information you needed for the test. Anyways, today we're going to be talking all about World War II. We're going to combine a lot of stuff. We're going to go through this a little fast. There's a lot to cover World War II, so if you see a slide and there's something on it that I didn't talk about, just hit pause and you know, review it and look at it yourself. There's a few things that I just wanted to cover to make sure that all of our bases are, are handled before we move on and we take the test. So today we're talking about World War II. All right, so as you might remember from our lecture after World War I and a little bit of the Roaring Twenties, uh, we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but the United States goes through a period of something called isolationism. After World War I, the United States really didn't focus on anything else but themselves. Remember, before World War I really got difficult for the United States, before the United States got involved in World War I, we were isolated. We did, were neutral. We didn't want a part in it. And when we fought in World War I, we didn't really get anything out of it. So we turned our backs on the rest of the world. In the 1930s, most Americans didn't really pay attention to what was going on in Europe and the rest of the world because they were worried about starving and being out of a job during the Great Depression. And many Americans were very frustrated with Europe. During the 1920s, when times were good in the United States, but Europe was having a bad economic time, they were having their own depression, the United States loaned a lot of money out to Europe, and Europe didn't really pay us back the way that they should have. And many people in America were upset with Europe after all the, you know, the, all the ignoring, ignoring that Europe did to American demands. After World War I, we talked about Woodrow Wilson and how he tried to create the 14 points to stop any future wars from happening. And then Europe just ignored all of them but the League of Nations. That made a lot of Americans upset. And we refused to join the League of Nations after World War I because we didn't want to get tied down to the rest of the world. So the United States was isolated. We focused on ourselves and let the rest of the world do their own thing. But while the United States is focused on ourselves, bad things start happening across the world that we kind of ignore until it becomes a problem that ultimately affects us. For example, Japan invaded China and conquered Manchuria in the year 1931. Manchuria is kind of the northern section of China, and you can look it up on a map. But Manchuria was a big region that had a lot of resources, and China just went, went to war with Japan, and they lost it. And Japan took it over and conquered it. And most of the time, that would be a big deal. Millions of people being conquered and put under control of another country. People across the world didn't really care, especially in the United States. And we didn't really care about the fate of the Chinese or the treaties that made that invasion illegal. The only thing the United States really did was something called the Stimson Doctrine, where we just kind of slapped Japan on the wrist and said, bad Japan, don't you invade China again or else we'll be mad. But we really didn't do anything behind, we didn't have anything behind that threat. And so Japan just kept doing what it wanted to do the whole time and things got worse. The United States, you know, we had helped Japan earlier on build up an industry back during the imperial era. We gave China, Japan a lot of advice on how to build their own military. And now in the 1930s, Japan's military is ready to expand. While FDR tried to keep the United States from uh, having their currency tied to the gold standard, which was something that isolationists kind of wanted, he did try to increase international trade with the Holly Smoot tariff. FDR basically tried to keep the United States economically tied with the rest of the world, 
But um, Britain and other places won them on the gold standard. We didn't do that. Don't worry about the gold standard too much. Um, if we were in class, we could go into that a little more detail and do a little more research on it. But for right now, just know this, FDR didn't really do a whole lot with foreign policy, except for he tried to lay the groundwork for the United States to have some friends. For example, in 1933, the United States recognized the Soviet Union. What recognition means is that the United States literally says the Soviet Union has a right to exist, which we did not say between 1917 and 1933. When Russia was an empire, they had a revolution in 1917, it became a communist country called the Soviet Union, and the United States refused to recognize the Soviet Union's right to exist. We said, no, y'all are not supposed to be a country. Russia should be the, you know, the empire of Russia. But by 1933, the Soviet Union's not going anywhere anytime soon. And so the United States says, you know what, let's, let's at least be not enemies with Russia. Let's at least have something like a friendship, which comes in handy later on. And we start doing more friendly relationships with Central America and the Caribbean. We kind of walk back from that Teddy Roosevelt speak softly and carry a big stick sort of diplomacy. And we start trying to have friends in Latin America and in the Central America and the Caribbean. We don't want to have more enemies. We want to have less. But while the United States is focused on itself, there is a storm brewing across the rest of the world. There's a large growth in dictators and militarism across the world, specifically in the countries of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Let's start with Germany first. So as you recall from when we talked about the Treaty of Versailles after World War I, Germany got a lot of pressure put on them at the end of World War I. The Treaty of Versailles forced Germany to repay Britain and France for the damage that they caused in the war. It took away a lot of the land that Germany had. It took away all their colonies. It reduced the size of their military. They had to apologize for the cost of the war. The list just went on and on and on. And Germany was so hamstrung by the Treaty of Versailles, plus they had to rebuild their country after World War I, that they plunged into a deep economic depression. It got to the point where Germany was having to pay these reparation bills all the time to Britain and France, but they didn't have any money to back it up. So they just started printing more money. They realized that, you know, they have to pay, say, a million marks. That was the money in Germany at the time was marks. You have to pay, say, a million marks to uh, Britain. Well, they just get some paper out and print off a million marks with no gold or silver to back it up. This led to hyperinflation to the point where German money became literally worthless, except for like the worth of the paper. You could have a barrel full of money and the barrel was worth more than the money inside the barrel, okay? And so Germans, <clears throat> they were in a very bad economic situation in the 1920s and they had this really um, a spectacularly failure of a government called the Weimar Republic or the Weimar, W-E-I-M-A-R. It's a... Uh, they were not very effective, <clears throat> and they were unable to really deal with the problems that were going on in Germany. So Germany had different political groups vying for power. There, were e there was even a communist group in Germany, but the group that caught on was a group called the National Socialist Party, which we call the Nazi Party. The National Socialists or the Nazi Party, they were led by a charismatic leader named Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was... Back in World War I, he was a soldier. He's a failed art student. Well, by this time, he's in politics, okay? And Adolf Hitler, he brings forth a new idea in German politics that becomes really popular. You have to understand that the people in Germany, they're not different from other people across the world. They were people just like us. And it's really scary how easily they fell into fascism. First off, they were desperate. They were desperate, their country was in shambles, and they needed and wanted help. Think about the United States. During the Great Depression, we were so desperate, we let FDR do a lot of things that were unheard of, like Social Security, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. Thankfully, we had a Supreme Court and a Constitution to keep us from going too far afield, but we were so desperate during the Great Depression, we did things that we would have thought unthinkable just a few years before. So in Germany, they're really desperate. The economy is in shambles. 
they want someone to get the country back to work. <clears throat> the other thing is Germany was psychologically damaged from World War I. There is serious, you know, just failure in the German spirit. They lost the Great War and they felt like they were losers. They had to say they were sorry to Britain and France. They had to pay all this money to Britain and France. And it really brought down the national spirit. And so when Hitler went around and started talking about how Germans were special, the Germans were not losers. They were a special type of people, the Aryans, the best people in the world, the Ubermensch, as Hitler called them, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed people that were supposed to rule the world. People felt that and they said, hey, that's, he's talking about me. I feel, that makes me feel good. I'm special. And Hitler made Germans feel special. He told them that they were good. He told them that they were the best. And then he said, it's not your fault that we lost World War I. It's the fault of the Jews. Hitler capitalized upon anti-Semitism. Throughout European history and throughout world history, there's been a history of people hating and having prejudice against Jewish people. And it's led to monstrosities all throughout history. Throughout European history, there is a lengthy, lengthy list of times whenever Jewish people were attacked or killed just for being Jewish. There's a long-standing tradition of prejudice and hatred against Jewish people throughout European history and throughout the world. And so there's already a little bit of racism in Europe that goes back almost to the time when Christianity first came onto the scene. Because, you know, the early Catholic Church looked at the Jewish people as sinners that had killed Jesus, that had refused to convert to Christianity, they had refused to re recognize the Messiah. And so many people in Europe thought of Jews as, you know, nuisances or just plain old bad. And so this, this deep-rooted prejudice was deep within Germans. And when Hitler started talking about it, he started saying things that many German people thought and felt within themselves, that they were special and that they thought Jews were bad. And this, Jew, this hatred of Jews allowed for the German people to say, we weren't failures, the Jews betrayed us. And the problems that we have are not our fault, they're the Jews' fault, or they're Britain's fault, or there's France's fault. And he creates scapegoats, okay? And one of the things that's important in a fascist ideology like Nazism is to have a villain, to have someone that you hate, because that common hatred unites people together. You can all combine and be as one by hating Jews. That's the idea behind Hitler's uh, fascist ideology. Just look at this big old crowd. Thousands and thousands of people would come and hear Hitler speak. He'd have these mass rallies. There'd be flags everywhere. He'd get up, he'd start speaking and yelling and, and ranting and raving. And he was a very dynamic speaker. He could make people laugh. He could make people cry. He could make people angry. He could make people just all sorts of different emotions. He could play people like a fiddle. And he would get these big crowds together and the energy would just be, you know, mag you know just massive. And people would feel it. And they would feel that anger. And when everyone else around you is yelling death to this or death to that or we hate Jews or we hate this, people start joining in. Okay, if you've ever been in a basketball game or a football game and you've you know, heard people chant and say, ah, let's go win the team or say bad things about the other team and you join in, you might have become part of a, a crowd. When people are in crowds, they think and they act differently than when they're by themselves. You can take someone by themselves and talk to them and they might make very rational decisions and say, oh, well, you know, Jews aren't really that bad. I've got a friend that's a Jew and he's okay. But when you put them in a crowd, everyone around him is talking about how they hate Jews. Well, you don't want to stick out, okay? And so Hitler was able to tap into some frustrations that the Germans had. He was able to tell the Germans that they were special. And then he made promises to the German people that if they banded together under his lead, that he would make them a super great country. He would expand their borders. He would reclaim lost territory. He would build up Germany and make it a great and powerful nation once again. Think about the word Third Reich, which is what Hitler liked to call his regime in Germany, the Third Reich. What that means is it's like the Third Empire, the first empire being the Roman Empire, the greatest empire in Western history. The Second Reich being the Holy Roman Empire, which was 
based in Germany, modern day Germany with Charlemagne, the great king. And then you have the Third Reich and Hitler said, I'm going to be like the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire. And I'm going to build Germany back up and make it rule Europe once again. And so people united together under Adolf Hitler. And I want to be very clear. Some people talk about Hitler as though he took power in Germany. That's not true. The German people gave power to Hitler. They wanted him in charge. He did not. He did a little bit of shady stuff. There were some people that got beat up. There were some, you know, bad things that happened as far as the election goes. But Hitler was popular. He was very popular in Germany. And the people of Germany loved him. And they, and that's how you take normal, regular people and turn them into Nazis. It's not as though they were particularly evil people. I think something very similar could happen all across the country. And we see all across the world different places that have that same experience during the 1930s. And when you compare it to some things that happened in the United States, there were people in the United States that wanted to be fascist too. So don't think that the Germans were just particularly evil. They just had all the right ingredients and they went evil. Okay, but it could have happened anywhere. And that's why we need to be vigilant, not to get on a soapbox, but we have to be very careful when people try to scapegoat or blame all our problems on one group of people or talk about changing things just for the sake of solving some big problem and making the whole place different. You know, you can see those warning signs of fascism. So you need to be careful. Italy had very similar process, but there a leader was not as charismatic. That's Benito Mussolini right there standing next to Hitler. They also called him Il Duce or whatever. Uh, um, Benito Mussolini, he was the leader of the fascist party in Italy. Fascism is simply a ideology, a political ideology that is not democracy. It's not communism. It's entirely separate. Um, think about it like this. You see one stick, one tiny stick, easy to break. Put a bunch of sticks together, it's hard to break, okay? You get 30 sticks in a row and you put them in your hand, it's hard to break that. Well, it's easy to break one, one stick. So the idea behind fascism is to make everybody in the country bundle together for strength, okay? So in fascism, there is no individual. We... If you're in a fascist country or a fascist system, individuals are just like cogs in the machine, like a big clock. Every single cog is working in unison together to do something as a whole. And so fascism can do some things that democracy can't. It can very quickly make people do things very fast, and it can coordinate a large number of people to do certain tasks, but it does not respect people's freedom and it does not respect people's individual rights. If you have a clock and one cog or one wheel in the clock is not spinning at the same rate as all the other clocks, if it decides to do its own thing, you get rid of that and you throw it out. And that's the same idea. If you're in Italy and you're not doing what Benito Mussolini wants, if you're not spinning your wheel just like he wants it to, they just get rid of you, okay? And that happens in Germany and in Italy too, okay? In these countries, individual rights and freedoms are very quickly taken away, especially for Jewish people. We'll talk about that more. But the Jewish people become ostracized in Germany. They're forced to wear yellow stars. They're forced to only live in certain parts of town. And that just keeps on ratcheting up and up and up until you get to the point where Jews are being rounded up, thrown into work camps, worked to death, and eventually thrown into extermination camps and killed in the Holocaust, okay? So that's the problem. When you start taking away people's individual rights, you don't have anything to protect people. And so if the government says, hey, we don't like you anymore, or you don't fit into our plan, you're not spinning your wheels like we want you to, you're out of here, okay? There is no freedom. There is no Supreme Court that's going to save you in a fascist society. And lastly, we have Japan. Japan was um, an island nation that was imperial, okay? And Japan went totalitarian, but they didn't have a dictator, they had an emperor, and that's Emperor Hirohito. With the way that the Japanese religion worked was that Hirohito was a god in the eyes of the Japanese people, and so his word was divine. And so Japanese people living, uh, living under his rule had to obey him with their whole lives 
and that was their religious duty. Okay, it wasn't just because they liked their king, it's they had to do it because he was a god. Okay, and so the Japanese become quickly militarized leading up to World War II, and the military takes over most of the functions in the government of Japan, and the Japanese military wants to expand. They want to grow. Japan is an island. It doesn't have a whole lot of resources. That's why they invade Manchuria. That's why they had control of Korea. And later on, that's why they invade China, is they want resources that they can't get on their island. So we've got some bad dudes taking over across the rest of the world. What's the United States doing? Not a whole lot. Anti-Semitic or anti-Jew rhetoric is made popular in Germany. Italy decides to expand its borders and invade the African country of Ethiopia in 1935, takes it over, the rest of the world doesn't really do anything to help out the Ethiopians. In Spain, there's a fascist government that gets set up by a guy named General Francisco Franco. Franco doesn't take over the whole country all at once like Hitler and Mussolini did. Instead, it leads to a long, bloody civil war in Spain where Germany and Italy sent money and weapons to the uh, nationalist or the fascist side of the Spanish Civil War, and it drags on for a long time. While this is going on, the United States, Great Britain, and France don't do a whole lot. We, we were so worried about World War I happening again that we said, you know what, maybe we'll just let this, let, let's just let Spain go fascist, let's just let Ethiopia get conquered, and maybe the problem will go away. The United States is so determined not to get involved in these wars that we pass a series of laws called the Neutrality Acts. 1935 Neutrality Act prevents the sale of weapons to countries that are at war. 1936 prevents the loan of money to countries that are at war. And finally, in 1937, the Neutrality Act of 1937 makes trade with any countries that are at war illegal. And that is all done to keep the United States isolated from any wars happening in the world. Now, some people say that World War I began, or World War II begins with the invasion of Poland in 1939. In my opinion, it really starts in 1937 when Japan and China go to war over a border dispute at the Marco Polo Bridge. After this, border dispute, Japan launches a full-scale invasion of China. Japan's military is more modern, it's better trained, better equipped, and they're more effective in combat. But China is huge, and there's lots and lots and lots of people in China. And Japan just can't seem to conquer China. It's like every time they take a mile, every time they kill a Chinese soldier, there's 10 more that take its place. And so Japan ends up using extremely brutal tactics to try to try to cripple China. Okay, Japan, to try to keep Chinese people from resisting, they just get really, really cruel. They start killing lots and lots and lots of civilians, lots of captured soldiers. It gets really bad. For Japanese soldiers, they live by a code called the Bushido Warrior Code which is kind of like the old samurai warrior code where honor is more important than your life. So for a Japanese soldier to surrender is worse than death. A surrender means that you've given up your honor. You have disgraced the emperor. You've disgraced your ancestors, your descendants, your children, your grandchildren are disgraced. Your parents, grandparents, great grandparents, they're disgraced. If you surrender, you are worse than anything else. So most Japanese soldiers would prefer to die in combat or kill themselves rather than get captured by the enemy. The Chinese soldiers don't have that same thought. And so Chinese soldiers get captured by the Japanese and the Japanese look at these Chinese prisoners as just worse than dirt. And so they have no qualms about slaughtering them. In fact, it was not uncommon for a Japanese officer to get his first action in combat was to execute a Chinese soldier, just to, just to prove that he was ready to lead men. Like, you know, let's say you're a Japanese lieutenant, you just graduated from war college, you go out to China, but before you can lead men, you have to chop off a Chinese soldier's head. That was the thing that would happen. And the Japanese were so callous in the way that they treated Chinese people, not just soldiers, but also civilians, 
there were millions and millions of Chinese civilians that were slaughtered for no good reason. Probably the worst example of this is the rape of Nanking. On December 1937 to January 1938, the Japanese military finally captured the Chinese capital. After they captured the Chinese capital, they began a month-long frenzy of murder, rape, looting, and torture that destroyed Chinese civilian and destruction of Chinese civilians by Japanese soldiers. Okay, there's some pretty nasty pictures if you want to look it up, but right there in this back here is a is a ditch full of Chinese bodies that just mass graves all across Nanking. And this was a awful, awful outrage. The, at this point, people in America finally start paying attention and saying, this is bad. There's estimated around 300,000 dead. This is a point of contention between Japan and China even to this day. Japanese historians or Jap the Japanese government or whoever you want to think of it, they try to say that less people died and then the Chinese government, they try to say that more people died than 300,000. But the truth is probably around 300,000 people died. For comparison, if you killed everyone in Corpus Christi, Texas, it'd be around the same amount of people that were killed in this month of terror. While things are getting bad in Europe, things are also getting bad in Europe. Uh, things are getting bad in Asia, things are also getting bad in Europe. Okay, in 1938, Germany decides to annex Austria. So that means they just take over and Austria becomes part of Germany. Then Germany places troops in the Sudetenland, which was a region in Western Czechoslovakia, which bordered Germany, that it had, had about 3.5 million Germans in it. Hitler says that he does these actions because there are German people living in Austria and there are German people living in the Sudetenland and they want to be part of Germany. So that's Hitler's nice explanation for what is really just him grabbing the land. Britain, France, Germany, and Italy meet together in Munich, Germany to try to find a peaceful solution to this crisis. And the British prime minister gets an agreement. His name was Neville Chamberlain. He gets an agreement with Hitler that leads a compromise. And he says, that Italy and Germany, they can have, Italy can have Ethiopia, Germany can have Austria in the Sudetenland, as long as they promise to never be aggressive again. All right, Hitler, we'll let you have the Sudetenland. Just pinky promise you won't try to take any more land. And Hitler's like, yeah, I promise. And he was lying through his teeth. But the British think that, hey, we got our deal. And Neville Chamberlain goes back home and says, I've achieved, we've achieved peace in our time. And that was absolutely not the truth. This is called appeasement. Appeasement was giving in to Hitler's demands to try to keep him from going to war. That's like giving your bully lunch money, hoping that he won't ask for your lunch money tomorrow. And it fails. Six months later, Hitler just decides to go ahead and take over the rest of Czechoslovakia. On August 1939, Hitler brokers an agreement with Joseph Stalin, who was the leader of the Soviet Union, Russia. They sign a non-aggression pact. They basically say, hey, we promise not to attack each other. And then Hitler invades Poland on September 1st, 1939. At that point, the Allies say, okay, fine. We're going to war. You've gone too far this time, Hitler. And so France and Great Britain, they declare war on Hitler and the war begins. The United States, when this happens, we say, hey, we're not a part of this. We're gonna be neutral, okay? France and Britain go to war with Germany and Japan and the United States tries to be neutral, but the United States very quickly says, okay, uh, we really don't want Germany to win, okay? We were very fearful of the possibility of what the world would look like if Germany won, and so we revised the Neutrality Act in 1939 to allow the sale of weapons to people who pay us in cash. Now, that works for a little while, but the Axis is very successful. In the very first year, few years of the war, Germany and Italy and Japan are just wiping the floor with the Allies. And so, people in the United States start getting worried that, hey, if we don't do something, Germany's going to win. And there's a national debate that emerges about whether or not we should get involved in World War II. FDR decides to move to allow the United States to send out aid to other nations in need with Lend-Lease Act, okay? The Lend-Lease Act was allowing us to 
lend equipment to other countries. We weren't selling it to them, we were letting them borrow it. Does that make sense? So that way we're not getting in trouble with the law, we're not selling anything, we're just letting them borrow it. So here, Great Britain, you can borrow this tank. Russia, you can borrow these machine guns. It's kind of kind of a funny way that politicians have to make words so that they don't contradict the laws, but that's what we did. We end up giving around $50 billion of aid to the Allies. You look at this chart, you see all the different countries that we sent money to and supplies to. Great Britain got around 31,000 million. Um, we got 10 million going to Russia. Um, We've got four million going to say Iceland, all these different places. We're sending lots and lots of money. Were it not for the United States and the money that we gave to Britain and Russia and other countries, it's very likely that Britain and Russia would have lost against Germany. Britain and Russia certainly fought very hard against, against Germany, but if we recall, who wins wars? You should probably be typing this in the comment. It's the person who has the most stuff. And so the United States provides the military equipment, the clothing, the food necessary for the Allies to survive in World War II. And when we get involved in World War II, we help turn the tide in favor of the Allies. Now, with Japan, we start really getting upset with Japan over China, okay? China is continuously being invaded by Japan thousands and thousands and ultimately millions of Japanese uh, or Chinese people are being killed by Japan and the United States is selling oil and metal to Japan. When the rape of Nanking happened, the United States was selling oil to Japan. We were selling them metal. We were providing them resources that they were then turning around and using to kill Chinese people. So in 1940, we start restricting exports to Japan. In 1941, we freeze Japanese assets. That means that money that is Japanese, but in American banks, they can't get to it. And we tell Japan, we say, listen, if you do not stop your invasion of China, we're gonna stop doing any economic interaction. with you." And so on August 1st, 1941, when Japan refuses to stop their invasion of China, we shut down the sale of oil to Japan. And so Japan starts planning for war. We don't know it yet, but the United States has really hurt Japan by cutting off their supply of oil. They need oil to run their tanks and their jeeps and their ships and their planes, and they don't have it. So the next best bet for Japan to get oil is Indonesia, or the Dutch East Indies, as it was called back then. But to get to the Dutch East Indies, they would have to go through the Philippines. And the United States owns the Philippines. So Japan realizes that one way or another, they're going to have to go to war with the United States. So they figure if they're going to go to war with the United States, they may as well get the first punch in. And so they plan an attack, a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii is where the United States fleet is anchored in the Pacific. Japan was desperate for an early victory, and so they launch a surprise attack. They catch the United States off guard, and they kill 3,000 Americans, even though we were technically at peace with them. Six battleships were destroyed. Fortunately, or rather, blessedly, the United States aircraft carriers were out on patrol at the time of the attack, and aircraft carriers become the major weapon of naval warfare in World War II. When this happens, the debates over whether or not we should or should not go to war are over. It's over, we're at war now. So the United States formally joins the Allies. And so now we're into the main part of World War II. So let's talk about the Axis powers. Those are what we would consider to be the bad guys, Germany, Italy, and Japan. What did they want? So we got Germany. Germany's goal in World War II was Lebensraum. That's like leg room, growing room. They wanted more land and more resources to spread out and to rule over Europe. They needed to quickly crush any potential opposition to the expansion of Germany. That meant that they had to fight and they had to fight fast. They used something called Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. The German military did not do trench warfare in World War I. They said, we're not doing that anymore. We've got tanks, we've got jeeps, we've got machine guns, we've got dive bomber airplanes. We're going to have mobile concentrated forces that'll just smash through the enemy. 
So France and Poland, they had these armies that were spread out all across their country. Germany would attack them in just say one spot and smash through the defenses, overwhelm them, take over their capitals, things like that, and just overwhelm the enemy very quickly. Germany relied a lot on mechanization, on tanks and airplanes, things like the Panzers, which were the German tanks, which were some of the best tanks in the world at the time. They outfitted their soldiers with submachine guns, so every soldier had more firepower. They used dive bombers like Stukas to attack uh, ground targets quickly and precisely, and they were able to overwhelm their enemies. Poland falls in a matter of weeks. Whenever they invade France, France falls in about 40 days. In the first few just days of the war, it seemed like Germany was unstoppable. Japan, their goals were to create something called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to kick out all the Europeans out of Asia and control Asia themselves. They called it Asia for the Asians, that sort of idea, but really it was for Japan. Japan constantly struggled with the scarcity of resources. They never had enough stuff that they really needed for their war effort. And that's part of why they invaded China was to get those resources. The oil embargo forced them, you know, if they were wanting to continue their war effort, they had to invade the Dutch East Indies or Indonesia to get oil, which then led to the war with the United States. They also needed scrap iron and they knew that they could not win a long war. Japan did not have the resources to win a long war with the United States. So their goal in Pearl Harbor was to quickly and dynamically destroy the enemy and win it fast. They wanted to break the will of their opposition before their advantage was lost. It didn't work for them though because the United States managed to take that first blow and keep on fighting. Italy is kind of like the one person in the group project that doesn't do any work, just kind of there. They put their name on the project, but then they don't even show up on the day that you're supposed to present the project and the teacher kind of even forgets that they were on your team until at the very end they say, hey, I, 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 was, on this, I was on this team. That, that's Italy, okay? Italy wanted to create something like a fascist Roman Empire with Benito Mussolini as, you know, their, the new Caesar. They wanted to conquer North Africa, but they were internally divided. There was a lot of opposition to Mussolini. Their military wasn't that good, and they were losing a lot of the battles that they got involved in. And what actually happens in World War II is, you know, Germany is off fighting Russia or fighting Britain, and Italy's got to fight someplace like Greece. You know, okay, Italy, you can handle Greece, but Italy couldn't handle Greece. So then Germany had to go and bail them out, okay? And so Germany has to waste a lot of their resources on keeping Italy from falling apart because they were the weakest of the Axis powers. Now the Allies, they were a lot more uh, coordinated than the Axis, okay? Rather than arguing over who's gonna conquer Greece, the Allies coordinated very frequently. A lot of people don't think about this, but really the heavyweight of the Allies was the Soviet Union. In terms of manpower and in terms of just you know, killing German soldiers, the Soviet Union takes the prize, okay? For them, they refer to the uh, World War II as the Great Patriotic War, where they fought for the motherland, the Rodina, okay? The Russians were all about defending themselves from what was from the German invasion that happens in Operation Barbarossa. The Russians relied on their superior numbers. A lot of times, Russian soldiers didn't even have guns. They just kind of threw them into battle and said, okay, go find a dead body pick up the gun, fight with it. When you die, someone will pick up your gun and fight for you, okay? But they had plenty of people, they just didn't always have the supplies they needed. Another thing that the Russians relied upon was the winter. When the Germans invade Russia, they invade in the summer, in their summer uniforms, but their invasion isn't fast enough and pretty soon it gets cold. And then the Russians take advantage of that cold to turn the tide against the Germans. Once the Russians turn the tide, they push forward in advance and they pushed the United States to start a second front in France to help them win. After World War II, Russia's goal was to gain spheres of influence. Remember, Russia, Soviet Union is communist. Everywhere their soldiers go, they bring communism with them. Great Britain, their main goal at the beginning of World War II was to survive. In 1940, France falls. And it isn't until about 1941 that Germany invades the Soviet Union 
And it's not until 1941 that the United States gets attacked and is joined the war. For, for about a year, Great Britain is fighting Germany, Italy, and Japan all by themselves. And their main goal is to survive. The Battle of Britain was the air battle that was raged over the island of Great Britain um, during 1940, over the summer, and Britain tried the best they could to survive the Blitz. You see, German tanks were able to conquer pretty much all of Europe, but because the fact that Britain was an island, they were able to survive, okay? And so Germany had to try to take over Britain through the air. Britain had a pretty good navy and they had a pretty good air force and they were able to hold off the German invasion. The phrase, keep calm and carry on, you might have seen it on a t-shirt when you just can't even, you just gotta keep calm and carry on. That phrase actually comes from Great Britain during World War II, during the Blitz, where you would have nightly raids, daily raids of places like London and other cities in uh, England that would just get bombed in and bombed out by the Germans. And the British were just told to keep on going, keep calm and carry on, just live life like you can. That's why you see people delivering milk in the middle of a war zone, which is, I think, like the most British picture you can ever think of. Britain had to coordinate all their logistics because Britain had a lot of colonies and a lot of um, <clears throat> countries that were uh, under their influence, like Canada, Australia, India, that they had to coordinate all their colonies in this war. Places like Egypt, the Suez Canal that was under their control, they all had to manage all that. So there was a lot of logistics that Britain had to deal with. Britain's main goal in World War II was to recapture their colonies that they had lost and defend themselves. And Britain had the advantage of technology, specifically the radar. Radar was a new invention that allowed for the British to see German planes coming to attack them. And this allowed the British to effectively defend themselves from the Germans. And then Germany's main goal, uh, Britain's main goal is to get the United States to join the war. Now the United States, we joined the war after Pearl Harbor and we are excited to get revenge. But we decide to focus on Germany first. FDR sees that Hitler is the greater threat and so we focus on taking Germany out first and then dealing with Japan. The United States puts all our industry, all our factories, and totally mobilizes to fight in World War II. When World War II happens, the Great Depression ends. We talked about in the last video about whether the New Deal ended the Great Depression. Really didn't. World War II ended the Great Depression. When World War II hits, everybody's got a job. You either got a job as a soldier, or you got a job working in a factory making guns and uniforms and tanks and airplanes for soldiers. Women have a job. Men have a job. Everybody's got a job. Okay, World War II ends the Great Depression, right? We have to fight a war on three continents, Africa, Europe, and Asia, and across two oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, and there's a lot of logistics that have to be coordinated with all those millions of soldiers operating all across the world. There's a lot of people that fight in World War II that never fight a shot, but they spend a whole lot of time driving supplies around, and those people are important. Remember, soldier doesn't have food, if he doesn't have clothes, if he doesn't have a gun, he's not going to fight, okay? You've got to have people to take care of that, so the whole country gets involved. The Allies' major advantage is coordination. They got together frequently. This is Winston Churchill, the leader of the United Kingdom or Great Britain. This FDR, leader of the United States. Joseph Stalin, leader of the Soviet Union. They worked together to fight the Germans and the Japanese. On the home front, as the United States prepared for war, the demand for labor in the war effort would bring an end to the Great Depression. Uh, to raise the money for the government would issue war bonds. That's a, like a, you give the loan to the government. You give the government $25, after the war's over, they'll give you $30 back. That's the idea of a war bond. And a lot of people bought war bonds to help pay for the war effort. And that shows the volunteerism or the willingness of Americans to help the war effort. There's a lot of propaganda that was made during World War II to try to convince people to support the war effort. Plant a victory garden, save the food that's at the grocery store for the soldiers fighting abroad, and you plant yourself a garden for your own vegetables. The United States industry switched from peacetime production to wartime. The automobile industry converted to making tanks. Maybe you have a factory that made refrigerators. Now they're making guns. 
Americans were asked to conserve their resources needed for the war effort. Copper, rubber, gas, even certain foods were in short supply. And so people started rationing, okay? The amount of food that you might, could buy at the store would be limited so that, you know, everybody had enough, but there was enough saved that went off to fight in the war effort. Look at this graph here. Look at 1941, how many cars we make, and then how cars just flatline through the rest of World War II. But then look at tank production, how all of a sudden in those same years, those cars started, those car factories started churning out tanks. We're gonna skip this, just get, try to get through this a little faster, okay? Women in the workforce, Workforce for American women, the war brought not only sacrifices, but new jobs and new skills and new opportunities. Women couldn't enlist in the regular army to fight, so many of them joined things like the Women's Army Corps, which were support roles within the military. There's a lot of jobs in the military that are not fighting, okay, like we talked about. You know, somebody's got to drive a truck. Somebody's got to cook food for the soldiers. Somebody's got to work in the general's office and make sure that letters get out and letters are mailed out, you know. People have to get paid in the army. And so somebody's got to have the job of managing payroll. So there's a lot of jobs that women can do in the military that are not just fighting. Other than that, many women took over jobs formerly held by men, such as building airplanes or ships for the war effort. Rosie the Riveter is this iconic woman that, uh, right, we'll have a picture of Rose. Rosie the Riveter right here, iconic picture, um, propaganda poster saying, you know, we can do it. And women can join in the effort to win the war. And the war is a total war. Everyone in America is committed to winning the war, right? African-Americans also worked and served in World War II. African-Americans had to fight in segregated military units, but they fought with distinction and they contributed to the victory of the United States in the war effort. We have Mexican Americans also same similar uh, similar service record. Mexican Americans served in both the Army and the Navy, fighting in all the major campaigns. Even though they faced discrimination, segregated housing, low wages, and high unemployment in the United States as well. Even though they faced that discrimination, Mexican Americans still contributed to the war effort, and they fought with distinction and bravery. We're not going to talk about zoot suits right now. I'm trying to conserve time, but. That's an interesting topic for research if you'd like to look at it, a controversial event in American history. Native Americans, if you looked at all the minority groups in the United States during World War II, Native Americans enlisted in the war at the highest percentage, okay? Native Americans took advantage of World War II as an opportunity to prove themselves in many ways, okay? In fact, like the last Comanche war chief that there ever has been, got his war chief status in World War II. And it's so interesting that Native Americans who fought in World War II, they probably had grandparents or great grandparents who had fought against the United States back during the wars for the West that we talked about earlier this semester. But Native Americans served with distinction and bravery in the United States military. At this point, like we talked about before, most Native Americans have been Americanized. They've gone to American schools and they've become part of the United States and have been assimilated. And so there's a great desire for, among them to fight for their country and to prove themselves as warriors like their ancestors had been, okay, for many of them. One of the most famous groups of Native Americans that fight in World War II is the Navajo Code Talkers. They used their native language to talk on the radio and it was a code that no one really could decipher. There's nobody in Japan that knows how to speak Navajo pretty much, okay? And so whenever Navajo code talkers would get on the radio and talk to each other in the middle of the battlefield, the Japanese, they could try to listen in, but they couldn't figure it out. Now, the first few years of the war go pretty bad for the Allies. The Axis managed to capture pretty much all this gray area, almost capturing all the Soviet Union, getting everything but basically Great Britain. While in Japan, while on the Japanese front, the Japanese managed to capture a huge chunk of the Pacific Ocean in East Asia. But this is the high water mark. There are a few battles that, that turn the tide. The first one is Stalingrad, okay? Stalingrad is a major city in Russia. It was a major industrial manufacturing center, and it is regarded as the single largest and bloodiest battle of all time. Okay. What happens in Stalingrad, it's a long battle. It lasts for around six months, from August to February. Okay, That's 
that's a long battle, okay? That's, you know, half a school year of battle. But what happens is, is the Germans advance into the city of Stalingrad in late summer, and they manage to capture a large chunk of the city of Stalingrad. And the Soviet Union allows them to capture the city, but then they go around the Germans and they trap them in the city. And so the Germans, they, they take the center of the city, but then the Russians, they close the trap and they surround them. And this fight goes on for a long time and winter kicks in, it gets cold. And German soldiers who walked in with shirts and summer shoes, they're freezing to death. While the Russians, they're prepared for the winter. The Axis lose around 850,000 soldiers killed, captured, wounded in this battle. And these are some of Germany's best soldiers that get captured whenever they finally get surrounded in February and end up losing. The Germans lose a large amount of soldiers that were some of their best soldiers, and they really never recover. After this battle, the Germans have to retreat, and they never stop retreating, and the Russians follow them all the way back to the capital, Berlin. But Russia pays a heavy price. To get that victory, Russia lost over around 1,200,000 killed, captured, or wounded. But this turns the tide. Germany starts retreating, and they don't stop retreating until they lose. Now, the turning point of the German advance in Africa is the Battle of El Alamein. Okay, in North Africa on July 1st uh, through the 27th, 1942, this is a desert battle of lots of tanks, and the Germans are trying to capture Egypt. They're trying to capture the Nile River and the Suez Canal, and if they can do that, they'll cut off Britain from their colonies in India, and they'll really hurt the British war effort. But the British are able to stop them at El Alamein and turn them back. By 1943, May, the Allies recapture North Africa, and then they invade Italy afterwards, and Italy gets knocked out of the war. Okay, so by 1943, you've got three of the Axis, you've got three Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. By 1943, Italy's knocked out of the war, and Germany is now on the retreat from Russia and in Italy. Okay. Now, when it comes to the war with Japan, the turning point was Midway. If you look up Midway on a map, Midway is midway between America and Asia. It's like the halfway point in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And at the Battle of Midway, from June 3rd to the 7th, 1942, the Japanese had planned a surprise attack on the United States Navy, okay? Japan had a few aircraft carriers left, and the United States had a few, but Japan knew that every ship that they sunk that the Americans had, they could rebuild. But Japan couldn't do that. So Japan needed to buy time. So Japan planned one big attack where they could just knock out the rest of the American fleet that wasn't destroyed at Pearl Harbor. And if they could do that, then they could have free reign in the Pacific Ocean for you know, a year or two before America could rebuild their fleet. But the Japanese surprise attack was foiled by U.S. intelligence and codebreakers. American codebreakers cracked the code, they figured out what the Japanese were doing, and they turned the tables on them. The United States airplanes managed to destroy four Japanese aircraft carriers and hundreds of planes. Japan is unable to replenish their losses and they're put on the defensive for the rest of the war. And the United States starts marching its way through the islands of the Pacific Ocean to Japan. Now, after this turning point, the Allies advance. On June 6, 1944, the United States, Britain, and Canada, they invade Normandy beaches and D-Day in France. This opens up two fronts, and now Germany has to fight Russia in the east, the United States and Britain in the west, and they just can't do it, and they start collapsing. The Germans try one last desperate counterattack in the Battle of the Bulge, but it fails. And by May 2nd, 1945, the Russians capture Berlin. Hitler had committed suicide just a few days before. And so Germany surrenders by May 7th. For Japan, it's a lot more of a slog. The United States turns to island hopping. We don't fight for every single island in the Pacific Ocean. Sometimes we just let the Japanese have an island. We clear out the ships. We don't let them escape. And we say, okay, there's... 5,000 Japanese soldiers on this little island, they can have it. We're going to just surround them, not let them escape, and move on to the next one. 
in uh, in China slash Burma, which is Southeast Asia and India, American soldiers fight uh, alongside the Chinese, a group of them called the Flying Tigers, very famous. You can look them up. We're not going to talk about them too much right now. But the United States starts closing in on Japan by 1944 and 1945, and we start thinking about what it's going to be like to actually invade Japan. And we'd start learning things about the Japanese and the way they fight war. At the Battle of Iwo Jima, the United States invades a tiny, tiny little island, like around a mile or two square miles. And in that battle, we lose around like 8,000, we have around 20,000 casualties of different sort. I think 8,000 killed and 12,000 wounded. The numbers might not be exactly right. You can look those up. But on this tiny island, the Japanese fought tooth and nail for every square foot, and the American soldiers were killed at just enormous rates to capture one small island. And Americans start thinking, if they're fighting this hard for one tiny little island, what's it going to be like when we invade actual Japan? The Japanese were famous for charges called the bonsai charges, where Japanese soldiers, if they knew they were going to lose a battle, rather than surrender and live to fight another day, they would charge at the American positions, shooting their guns, throwing grenades, doing everything they could, and basically killing themselves in suicide attacks. And speaking of suicide attacks, the Japanese pilots start being trained to fly into American ships to kill themselves to try to destroy American ships in attacks called kamikaze attacks. What ultimately happens is the United States realizes that if we invade Japan, it's going to cost thousands and thousands of American lives. And we are not willing to accept anything less than unconditional surrender. That's on the test. Okay, Unconditional surrender is one of the test review. It's on the test review. Unconditional surrender is the idea that we weren't going to negotiate with Japan. We weren't going to negotiate with Hitler. We had no situation where we said, we're going to let Japan keep part of China and we take the rest of it back. We want Japan to completely and totally surrender. We accept nothing less than full and total victory. So even though we had basically put Japan on the defense, there's no way they're going to attack the United States again. We don't stop fighting until they surrender. We come after them. FDR dies in 1944, 1945. No, it's 1945. And Harry Truman, the vice president, becomes uh, president. When Harry Truman takes office, the United States is preparing to invade Japan. We print off so many Purple Hearts, which is the award that's given out to soldiers who are wounded that we kept using the Purple Hearts that we printed out for the attack on Japan, we kept using those through the Vietnam War, okay? There were so many expected casualties. The American soldiers expected thousands and thousands of soldiers to die during the invasion of Japan. And Harry Truman finds out about this thing called the atomic bomb. The United States scientists had been studying new science about atoms and about nuclear power and they had developed weapons that could use the force inside of a of an atom to create a massive explosion that would level an entire city in one shot harry truman learns about these bombs and he says let's try those and see if that'll win the war rather than sacrificing all those american lives so we drop an atomic bomb on hiroshima in august 6 1945 we drop another one on Nagasaki, Japan, on August 9th, 1945, and Japan surrenders shortly after. This is pretty sobering. Thousands and thousands of innocent civilians die because of this attack. The United States rationalizes this by saying that had we not dropped those bombs, we would have had to invade Japan, and then probably more people, Americans and Japanese people, would have died through all the battles that would happen. Remember what happened to Iwo Jima, a tiny little island where, you know, just a, a mile or two square miles, you have nearly 20,000 people dying. Multiply that times the whole of Japan. Some people say that the casualties in the atomic bomb attacks are worth it. Regardless, it's very controversial, and it comes back to this idea of unconditional surrender. We wanted Japan to unconditionally surrender, and we did whatever it took to get there. 
World War II is the most destructive war in world history by every metric, by the amount of money it cost, by the amount of lives that were lost, etc. And what's crazy about World War II is the number of civilian deaths far outpaced the number of military deaths. If you look at casualties, the Soviet Union suffered the most, around 24 million, 20 million Chinese. If you look at the percentage, Poland lost nearly 16 percent or 14 around 18% of the population of Poland died in the war. And a lot of that was because of the Holocaust, because of the Jews that were exterminated and, and murdered by the Germans. Um, but massive casualties throughout. World War II brought out some of the worst of humanity, okay? The Japanese, they were notoriously cruel. We talked about the rape of Nanking and the death of hundreds of thousands of Chinese civilians, but even American soldiers. When the Japanese captured the Philippines, they forced thousands of American soldiers to march their way across the Philippines in something called the Bataan Death March, where thousands of them are killed, and they're forced to build a prison, and the conditions are awful. And remember, the Japanese treated POWs or prisoners of war like they were worthless, because that's how they felt. They felt that to surrender was to lose all honor, so they treated prisoners terribly. The Germans are responsible for the worst atrocity of World War II, the murder of around six million Jews and millions of other people that they consider to be undesirable in the Holocaust. Okay, absolutely horrible tragedy. I mean, it's a consequence of that fascist ideology. This is where racism leads to. You let racism go unchecked and you start to say that this person is bad because of their race and you let that go all the way, this is what it can lead to. That's why it's bad. The United States was not without its own controversies, okay? You know, look at this right here. What are you gonna do about it? 5,200 Yank prisoners killed by Jap torture in the Philippines. Cruel march of death described. Stay on the job until every murdering Jap is wiped out. So this is a propaganda poster talking about the Bataan Death March, and it's telling Americans to stay on the job until every murdering Jap is wiped out. Look at the language there. It's not saying keep fighting until we win, it's saying wipe them out. That's that unconditional surrender. We want to win the war and we want to punish our enemies. And that is the kind of thinking that lets us get to a point where we say this is okay. Fat man and little boy, the atomic bombs that killed thousands and thousands of people that weren't soldiers. They're just men, women, children, people, innocent bystanders. But that's what World War II was. It was a total war. More civilians die in this war than soldiers. All the bombing, all the raids, all the destruction, the Holocaust, all that stuff killed more people than soldiers dying in battle. The United States, they did other controversial things. One thing that happened was the forced relocation of Japanese Americans. When Pearl Harbor happened, many Americans were afraid that Japanese Americans, Japanese, people of Japanese descent living in the United States, they were worried that those were spies. And these fears were racially motivated. There was no evidence that the Nisei or Japanese Americans were more disloyal than German or Italian Americans. We didn't do this with German Americans. We did it with Japanese Americans. So this is racially motivated. The FDR issued an executive order 9066 that required all Japanese Americans to be placed in internment camps where they were forced to stay confined until the war was over, okay? This was, um, this was a big constitutional issue. FDR said the action was a military necessity, but these were many Japanese Americans, they were American civilians and their rights were restricted. They were forced to leave their homes and let their homes be destroyed or looted while they were gone and forced to live in essentially prisons for a long period of time. Um, now this is not, to be clear, this is not the same as the Holocaust, okay? The Holocaust, they were murdering those people. The Japanese Americans were not executed by American soldiers, okay? They were put in confinement and they were not allowed to leave, but they weren't, you know, executed. It's still bad, but some people like to equate this with the Holocaust, and I don't think that that's right to do. I think we need to recognize it for what it is. It was bad, but it's not the same as the Holocaust. 
The Supreme Court stated in the Supreme Court case Korematsu versus U.S. that the that the relocations of Japanese Americans were okay because in wartime sometimes your liberties may be limited. It wasn't until the 90s that the United States finally formally apologized to Japanese American and gave restitution to those people that had suffered loss. So it took them 50 years before they got an apology. But after World War II, Germany is defeated, Japan is defeated, and the big dogs are the United States and the Soviet Union. We were friends during World War II, but after World War II, we started realizing that our friends were not that friendly. And that, yeah, the Soviet Union is better than Hitler, but it doesn't mean that they're any good. So we can talk about that later when we talk about the Cold War. You should now have enough information to do well on the test that I sent out this week. If you have any questions, please call me, please message me, please uh, email me, or leave a comment down below if you have any questions. Here's a thought. Was it justified for the United States to drop the atomic bombs in World War II? Was that good? Was that bad? Leave a comment below and let me know what you think. And today's episode was brought to you by, again, washing your hands and staying at home. Wash your hands, stay at home, do your homework. We are thankful for that sponsorship. And I hope you all have a good day.